בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, את רבנו מאיר אזולאי, מהשם תהיה רפואה שלמה, הצלחה, ברכה, פרנסה בשפע, כל הטוב בעולם, ממש, ever since I met מאיר, he's been going to different tests after tests, וברוך השם he takes it with love, that's the true heart of a צדיק, so may השם give him All the good that's in this world and the next world, Be'ezot Hashem, soon. Also, the shiur will be for Refua Shlema ve'lida kala to Debi, Bat Rachel ve'Victor. May she have a lida kala coming soon, Be'ezot Hashem. We'll go visit them in California, my brother's wife. Also, Refua Shlema to Ephraim. רבינו אפרים בן חיים, השם גיבר עם רפואה שלמה, צדקת וייף, סארה, אוסו גיבר רפואה שלמה של שאלה בייבי ברוך השם, בייבי גרל, והשם ראי, גיבר כל הזכויות של השיעור, לזה חוסול, To uh, to bring a lot of bracha into this house, we need some more bracha to the Shem. Amen. So I don't know if you uh, guys follow. We're going to start with a little bit of current events, and then we're going to get right into the parasha. But there's a few current events that uh, I think uh, if you don't know, you should know, and if you uh, do know, then uh, again you should know, uh, because uh, as Hashem works His world. One of the things that we see is that when someone goes to a difficult test, it's very difficult for them to understand why is Hashem doing this to me? Why did I get a flat tire? Why did I get, you know, this and that? Why did I lose this job? Why did I lose money? All these different things. People have a hard time understanding how Hashem works. Uh, and this is why Hashem... is uh, obviously his intellect is not like ours. And this is why when Hashem and Moses were talking in Mount Sinai, he told Moses, no man can see my face and live. He didn't literally mean no one can see my, my physical face. Hashem doesn't have a physical face. It's one of the 13 principles of faith in Judaism is that Hashem, he has no body and has no resemblance of a body. So what does it mean no, one, no man can see my face and live? is that no man can see what I'm doing or the future and live and understand it. Why? Why can't they see now and understand it? Because as I'm doing it, there are millions and millions of things that have to fall into place that he's going to obviously put them into place that will eventually make sense to us. Mm-hmm. But if you see what Hashem is doing right now, somebody got a flat tire, somebody got into Hashem Shalom an accident, mm-hmm. somebody had, a guy, you know, is sick, couldn't go to work today. Sorry, Anything else, he's like, why is Hashem doing this to me? I'm a tzaddik, I'm going to Beknesset at least twice a year. You know, what's happening? <laughs> uh, you know, why is Hashem doing this to me? So Hashem says, you're not going to understand if I show you everything I'm doing now. But... He showed, uh, he showed Moshe Rabbeinu his back. What does it mean he showed his back? He showed him everything he did in history until that point. From creation, from Adam HaRishon, all the way until Parashat Yitro. Everything that happened until Mount Sinai. And he showed, why he was able to show him? Because then Moses is able to understand. Because now it's after it already happened. Why did you bring the flood? Why did you create man? Why is there a tzaddik that has a, a difficult life and a wicked person that has a, um, a good life, or at least it seems? Why is this one got sick? Why, is that one, why did you make the whole Akedat akeda Yitzchak? What's the test all about? Everything that ever happened, now Moses was able to see because it was after the fact. So he was able to show him things after the fact. But if we notice, if we notice... The world today is that there's a lot of things that are unexplainable. Whether you're talking about the things that are happening in the world today and why Russia and China and North Korea and all of these countries are fighting over Syria that has pretty much nothing to offer. Or you're even talking about difficult topics like the Holocaust. Why did the Holocaust happen? But one thing we do know is that Hashem provides a cure before the illness. It's not apparent to us until after the fact. We don't realize that the flat tire that we got saved us from a car accident that would have been fatal. 
We don't realize that getting fired from a job opened up a door to getting a better job. We don't realize that one zivug that we thought was going to be our soulmate, getting broken up and breaking our heart, was only to make us available for the right zivug that Hashem really wanted to give us, that we deserve. It's hard to understand why Hashem does everything. Well, only human. Even Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't understand until Hashem showed him himself. But nonetheless, people have a very hard time talking about some things like the Holocaust. And unfortunately, when someone has the courage to do it, it's very easy for people to be heroes over the internet because obviously everybody is a birion. Everybody is a, is a uh, strong gibol, a big, a big hero over the internet, behind their keyboard and their, and their mouse and their uh, screen. And they make all these comments and this slander and Lashon Ara heaven pretty much becomes a uh, haven, becomes a, um, something that is running rampant throughout the internet today where instead of being a place where you can use the internet for good, learn some Shuret Torah, you know, learn some good things, unfortunately there are some kofrim in the world that use the internet as a haven for Lashon Ara. Yeah. And yeah. one main thing that happened is that there's the, uh, as, as you all know, we're big fans of Rabbi Mizrahi, he's been a big influence in our life. Uh, one of the main ones other than uh, Rabbi Frank Kachlon, uh, and others as well, but nonetheless, we have a uh, deep connection with Rabbi Mizrahi. Personally, I think he's a major tzaddik, and he's really a uh, rush. I've seen him at work, I've spoken to him, I've met him, I've, uh, you know, I've, I've seen his work, I've seen his uh, results, and uh, I, I think that he's, uh, aside from the fact that he's extremely popular, and probably one of the most popular, if not the most popular, Kiruv Rabbi in the world today, I still think he's underestimated for everything that he's done because a lot of the things that he's done, you'll only know if you know him, if you know him personally. Most people, you know, there's a very popular website called Torah Anytime, it's probably the most popular, you know, uh, uh, Torah site uh, here that you have Shuret Torah of different uh, rabbis. People don't realize that Rabbi Mizrahi is one of the people, is, is the first rabbi that put lectures there. He helped them start Torah anytime. Now it's obviously successful, Baruch Hashem, and a lot of people watching it. There's maybe four or five hundred rabbis that are on Torah anytime, and people are you know are watching their uh, their videos. But Rabbi Mizrahi is pretty much one of the foundations of Torah anytime. But because of the Lashon Ara that's happened in the last week, people have the audacity, these kuflim, these heretics that hate the Torah, hate the truth, hate hearing the answer that is not pleasing to them, uh, taking the internet and using it as a facility to say Lashon Ara about Rabbi Mizrahi to such an extent where they're saying that, oh, we're going to try to have the Torah anytime get his shulim out, we're trying to get his lectures canceled, we're trying, uh, they're, they're publicizing in the media different clips of his videos where in a way, it makes them look bad because if I have, okay, I have a two-hour shoe every week, but if you take two minutes out of my two hours, you, you may hear words that I'm saying over those two minutes, but the body of the, of the, of the subject, you didn't hear. You heard maybe the, the, the solution. You heard maybe one of the points, but the overall buildup to get to that bottom line, you didn't hear, so if you only hear that one point, it could either look genius or it could look horrendous. You could either look like a tzaddik, or you could look like a Nazi. And that's with any lecture. That's whether it's a, uh, a, a politician, or a businessman, or a rabbi. So there's a group of Rashaim that uh, for years already have been uh, taking clips of Rabbi Mizrahi's uh, lectures and trying to do their best to make him look bad. Right. Baruch Hashem, they did not have any success throughout all of that time. But as you would have it, the Satan knows that Rabbi Mizrahi just came back from a lecture, from a trip to Israel that was extremely successful, Baruch Hashem. Every lecture, hundreds and hundreds of people, free CDs, people doing tshuva, something amazing. Something he said, the best trip he's ever had as far as helping people do tshuva. Mamash, we're in Achit I mean, we're at the end of the days. Having such a trip is mamash, a gift from Hashem. He even has a video from Rabbi Cook, which is one of the tzaddikim of this generation. Rabbi Cook says... Says to Rabbi Mizrahi, it's a two-minute video, it's on the internet, you can watch it. 
Rabbi Cook, this is somebody that's holy is, 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 is an understatement. He says Rabbi Mizrahi is a gift to our generation. A gift to our generation. But then you have this group of Rashaim that have nothing to do with their life, most of which don't even keep Torah, by the way. They don't keep Shabbat, they don't keep mitzvot, they don't keep nothing. All they do is slander people on the internet, especially focusing on Rabbi Mizrahi. So they realize that, you know, Satan and, and them are on a first name basis. They talk to each other all the time. You know, they have a private suite in Gehenom that, you know, they're saving them, so themselves. So what do they do? At the end of the year, of the secular year, there's nothing to talk about. What is there to talk about in the media? Oh, 2016, what is there to talk about? Nothing to talk about, especially the Jewish sites. It's not our new year. So they take advantage. They take a clip of a four or five year old lecture that Rabbi Mizrahi did in Hebrew. A three minute clip where he says, he's teaching about the halacha of intermarriage. The problem of intermarriage, the silent holocaust that's happening today, which is that Obviously, Baruch Hashem, we don't have the death we had in the Holocaust, but we have a spiritual death right now because there's so much intermarriage. So many Jews are marrying Goyim. It's happening. Men are marrying women that are not Jews. Women that are Jews are marrying uh, men that are not Jews and so, and, and so on. It's happening in America. The assimilation statistics are the worst they've ever been, if not close to it. So he's, he's pretty much building, this is a Hebrew lecture, if you watch the entire lecture, you see that you know, what they're saying he said is not what he said. But nonetheless, the point is that he said, listen, what we're hearing that during the Holocaust we had 6 million uh, Jews that died, but everyone knows that there was a high assimilation rate before the Holocaust. It's a historical fact. Okay, of course, some you know, uh, people had less than others. You know, from Poland, maybe they had less assimilation because they had special laws where they pretty much uh, forbid the Jews to marry Goim. But in Germany, they didn't have such laws throughout most of the time they were there. In a, uh, you know, in, in, throughout all of Europe, they didn't have such laws, so there was high assimilation rates. And there's statistics out there. Now, either way, he says that, you know, it can be as much as 80% assimilation. Some are saying it could be as much as 80% assimilation, which means that the 6 million so-called Jews that died in the Holocaust may not necessarily be all Jews. Because to, to the Nazis, to the Rashaim Nazis, even if you were related to a, to a Jew, to a third party, let's say your mother and father were not, you know, your dad was Jewish, but your mom is not Jewish, they still consider you the Jewish. Even though based on Torah and Allah, you're not considered Jewish. If the father is Jewish... He can be King David even. But if your mom's not Jewish, you're not Jewish. Right. Same thing is if somebody says, no, my parents know, but my grandparents on my uh, father's side, one of them is Jewish, or my aunt is Jewish, or someone knows a Jew down the street. <laughs> to the Nazis, <laughs> to the Nazis, it just gave them an excuse to kill you. <laughs> Justify their evil. Same thing as this, these evil people that are spreading Lashon Hara. No, well, they don't have nothing else to do. They no, of course understand. not. Satan, Satan, yeah, of course, has nothing not religious. to do. But that's the point. Well, you when care. you're not religious and you look, and you see other people that are doing good, mm-hmm. that are bringing people to do mitzvot, it it's gets you. To, it gets you to feel bad. Why does it make you feel bad? Because it reminds you how wicked you are. Mm. That's why there's the fight. The biggest fight the the religious Jews have is other Jews. Mm-hmm. The Goyim don't care if you're religious or not religious. Small if anything, as a matter of fact, there's actually one reporter, a famous small. reporter in Israel, the did Tshuva. He was a, he's a specialist in uh, Arab-Israeli relations. He does much investigations and goes and interviews terrorists. I forget his name, but uh, he interviews terrorists. Mamash ter- takes risk. He looks Arab. He speaks Arab fluently, but they know he's Jewish. But then one day after he did tshuva, he interviewed one of these uh, terrorists. Oh, Yechezkeli. Yechezkeli is his mm-hmm. name? Yeah. Uh, so he interviews one of these terrorists. And uh, terrorist, uh, terrorist tells him, you know, every time you came here, I really wanted to kill you. I was thinking about the whole time you're interviewing me, I was thinking about killing you. How I'm going to kill you. But now that you're a real Jew... <laughs> And you're a real worker of Hashem. You're a servant of Hashem. Now I need to protect you. <laughs> Imagine that. A terrorist telling him, 
that he's there to protect them. So, and as actually, this is actually what the Lord Hashem says. Where it's a, uh, if you do what he wants, he'll fight your wars for you. Adonai lachem lachem, atem techarishun. When you do what Hashem wants, Hashem will fight your wars for you. Your enemies will become your friends. So, to move on with this issue, they made a whole big deal. They cut this clip. They sent it to the uh, Haredi web, uh, websites that have nothing to do with their life. And all of a sudden they're saying, oh, ra famous Rabbi Mizrahi is saying only a million Jews died in the Holocaust. <coughs> Because he says, you know, listen, it could have been a million Jews that were uh, kosher. It could have been three million. It could have been five million. He didn't just say, listen, only a million Jews, that's it. In a Holocaust mm -hmm. didn't happen like Iran. Yeah. Right, it's saying. Sure, so they just cut off a clip. And what a, what a Lashon Ara place it's become over the last several days. Completely distorting his words. Completely taking it to, out of context. And the worst part about it is that not one of these chachamim, one, not one of these people that is criticizing Rabbi Mizrahi is actually looking at the entire video, at the entire facts, at the anything. Why? Because they're too interested in Lashon Ara. The media is interested in Lashon Ara. Why is the media interested in Lashon Ara? Because Lashon Ara brings views. Viewer. When someone, when someone, when someone... When someone a, uh, wins the lotto, you hear about it one day, two minutes, that's it. We don't care one day. We don't care about it. You don't see any special shows about his life. When do you see a special show about somebody that won the lotto? After he lost all the money. <laughs> After he went bankrupt, you hear, oh, we have a special interview with Joe Smith that won $350 million six years ago, and now he's homeless. <laughs> 400 million viewers. The guy won $300 million. Nobody cared. Right? The guy won time. This guy won $1 million. That's it. Same thing with this. So these Khalidi websites are uh, publicizing it and uh, saying, oh, Rabbi did this, Rabbi did this. And now they're making up all of this Lashon Allah. The reality of it is that nothing of what he said was wrong. Of course... There's a way to say things. Maybe you could be a little, uh, you know, uh, I, um, there's a, some people are offended to hear about anything about the Holocaust. Some people are, uh, you know, need to be told certain things in a certain way. And maybe his way is more aggressive. Other people are less aggressive. Okay, fine. But you can't get any of that in a three-minute video. If you saw the 90-minute video, if you have a brain in your head and eyes on your face... You would see that the, the, the real point of what he means. And you see how much he loves Am Yisrael. But we see a three-minute video. No. So what's happening? So what happened after that? What really put this thing on the map? These zeros that call themselves rabbis, that have been rabbis for 20 years, 30 years, and can't get five people to follow them, or perhaps ruin their own reputations, are trying to build their careers. What's a better way to build my career... <laughs> then by talking about somebody that everybody else is talking about, saying more Lashon Ara about him, so I'll, I can get his fans, I can inherit his fans. I remember this from the business days. The way people tried to build their careers was on my back. Mm -hmm. Other people that worked at other firms would some would call my clients. You know, they would get their numbers in a different way. The client would tell them, "No, uh, you know, Ron Rubin is a uh, is my guy." So, oh, Ron Rubin, I know, and they start making up stuff. Oh no, I, I taught Ron Rubin everything he knows. The guy's been in the business for two years. I'm in 16 years. He taught me everything I know. Another guy says, no, I give him all of his research. Oh no, all these nonsense. Nonsense that you have to deal with. But that you have to, then the guy calls me, the client has to call me, and I have to prove to him that everything he says is nonsense and the guy's a criminal. Mm -hmm. But in yeah. the business world, people you know, are careful before they make decisions. But in, unfortunately, in the Lashon Ara world, People are very, very quick to write comments. Rasha, how could you do this? I hate you. Die. No, you should see what comments people are making. Hashem and Hashem. So, Baruch Hashem, I uh, had the privilege of putting something together. Anyone that wants to read it, I sent it to you guys in, uh, earlier this week, but I also printed a version of it explaining basically what happened. Uh, and then we're going to move on. A, uh, but obviously adding Torah to this. The 
most painful part is seeing the people that are supposedly rabbis and supposedly religious jump on the bandwagon and try to build their careers. One guy wrote a book about Jesus and how he's kosher. How much of an orthodox rabbi are you? You're writing about Avodah Zarah. Another guy is uh, being interviewed on the radio. He's being interviewed on the radio and he's pretending like he cares about the facts. The guy asks him a question. I could only listen to about two minutes of this. It's probably like an hour interview. Uh, he's, he's no, wait, hold on. Did he do this? This is what it says. Okay, we can move on now. So he pretends like, pretends like he cares. But in reality, he only knows three minutes worth of facts because he only saw the three minute video. He didn't see the 90 minute video. These fakers. So why is all of this happening? Why is all of this happening? Why is it so important to know these things? Because this itself is another one of the prophecies of the end of days. This is why I mentioned this. This itself is one of the prophecies of what's going to happen at the end of days. At the end of Masechet Sota, page 49, it says all the things we went over in one of the shuim a few weeks ago. One of the things it says, there's not going to be anyone to rebuke. Meaning that the people that do rebuke, people like Rabbi Mizrahi, people are going to go against them. Also says that people are going to hate people that are telling the truth. It also says the Pnei Adol uh, is a Pnei The face of the generation is a face of dog. Oh, what, what, has everybody turned into a dog? No, not physically, even though some of them look like dogs, especially with their behavior. But why a dog? Because a dog doesn't have chutzpah. A, do a dog has chutzpah, I mean. A dog doesn't have manners. A dog licks himself and does all he does in front of everyone and has no manners. And unfortunately, that's what the last generation is. This is exactly where we are. No one has manners. People make comments. They don't know anything. They're making a comment like they're dola do. They're saying, making judgments about a rabbi that made over 100,000 people do tshuva. Is giving away CDs and lectures for free for 21 years. Never charged a dollar for a lecture. But they're judging him based on a three-minute video. He's a rasha, he's a shame, he's an embarrassment to Judaism. He's this, he's that. Who are you, Bechlal? Who, who are you? Who are you the judge? So that's, that's, these are the things that are happening, unfortunately, in this world. Now, the connection here is that, why, why is all of this happening? How do we connect this to this Torah? And if you see from the article, in the letter response that uh, we wrote, is that when Yaakov Avinu worked for Lavan and got cheated by Lavan for 21 years, first seven years he got cheated because he was supposed to marry Rachel, but... Lavan, the wicked mobster, okay. yeah. cheated him. How did he cheat him? He said, no, he gave him Leah. Mm -hmm. So he had to work another seven years to get Rachel. After that, he had to get money. So that's 14 years I have to get money. So he worked for another seven years. But throughout those seven years, he changed the deal over a hundred times of what he's going to pay him. Mm -hmm. So he's been cheating him since day one. Everyone knows that Lavan is a cheater, wicked person. Right. Everyone knows. That's the reason why Yaakov went to him. Why? Because even Esav, the hero that he is, the Biryon, but mobster also, he was scared of Lavan. That's why Yaakov went there. He says, okay, Lavan, he's not going to chase me there. Maybe he's going to chase me right, maybe he's going to chase me left, but to Lavan's house, he's not going to go there. He's scared of Lavan. That's why he went there. 21 years, he's there. So I told him, mm -hmm. I'm Lavan Garti. Okay, that's wait. why he said, in Lavan Garti. He's like, oh. <laughs> So don't, don't, don't mess with me. I, I, I hung out with Lavan for 21 years. I can handle Lavan. I can handle you, he tells himself, when he sees him. But once he decides to leave, he tells his two wives, Rachel and, uh, and Leah, your father's been cheating me, so we need to leave. Wait a minute. Everybody knows he's a Rasha Merusha Lavan that's cheating you. Everybody knows he's cheating you. How is the was his own daughters don't know he's cheating you? Exactly. They don't know. Because for 21 years, Yaakov Avinu, why is Yaakov Avinu? For 21 years, he's being cheated. He and he never said one Lashon It's true what Lavan is doing. 
But that's what Lashon Hara. Lashon Hara is true. It's not Lashon Hara is a lie. That's Shemra. Motzi Shemra. Lashon Hara is when you say something true about someone, and and it's it's against them, it makes them look unfavorable. So when you're lying about someone, you say, oh, he stole this, but he didn't do it. That's Motzi Shemra. So for 21 years he's suffering. This guy is cheating him in every way possible. And he doesn't say a word to his own wives. Why? Because he's scared of Lashon Hara. Imagine that. So for the first time in 21 years, his own daughters, Lavan's own daughters are finding out for the first time their father's a cheater. They might have known on their own that he's not a righteous person, but they didn't know for sure. That's the difference. When you... Think, maybe yes, maybe no. It's different than knowing for sure. After that, his son, Yosef, obviously gets sold by his brothers, goes to Egypt, becomes the viceroy over there. The whole story, the brothers come. Mm -hmm. Eventually, Yaakov Avinu comes with 70 souls. Yaakov Avinu lives there for 17 years. At the end of his days, when he gives everyone the blessing... He rebukes the first couple of brothers, first three brothers. He rebukes, you know, rebukes. Ocheach tochiach. That's one of the mitzvot in the law. He uses this time to rebuke them to tell them what they're doing wrong. Uven, you made a mistake. Ta 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 ta. Shimon and Levi, accursed is your anger. Anger is like avodah zarah. So, so he's he's using this time to rebuke them, and then the other brothers, he's he's blessing them. But now is the question. You're upset at Shimon and Levi and Ruven for what they did. But what about all of the brothers for selling Yosef? That's very same brother that's giving you Parnassah every day, that puts you... It's giving you life right now. How come you're not telling them, listen, by the way, guys, you, should have, you shouldn't have sold Yosef. Why? Because Yaakov didn't know. Yaakov didn't know they sold him. Mm-hmm. Right, he didn't know. He didn't know. Why? Because Yosef never said Lashon Hara about his brothers. Yosef, even though it was true, they sold him. They were wrong for selling them. And he said, don't worry. You meant bad for me, but Hashem meant good for me. Never said Lashon Hara. That's also why when Paro, you see early in the parasha, Paro hears that Yosef's brothers are here in Egypt. Paro was very happy. One Midrash says he was happy because he says if Yosef is so good, another ten of him is great. But another one or eleven of them are great. But another thing to understand is that if Paro and Egypt knew that his brothers sold him, they wouldn't be happy his brothers came. They would think maybe they're trying to kill him. They're trying to kill our king. We got to get rid of these people. He's not going to be happy. It said Paro rejoiced. Why would we rejoice if they sold him? They almost killed their brother. Mm-hmm. Why? Because Yosef learned the Torah from his father Yaakov. Yaakov didn't say Lashon Hara. Yosef didn't say Lashon Hara. But then we have last week's parasha. Last week's parasha, Moshe Rabbeinu is born, grows up. He sees a Jew getting beat up by an Egyptian. He kills the Egyptian to save the Jew. The next day, that very same Jew that he saved, which his name is Datan, is fighting his brother-in-law. His name is Aviram. So Moshe sees it. He says, how did you get your own brother? He says, he says to the wicked one, it says in the Torah. He says to the wicked one, to the Rasha. Before, why Rasha? Because he already had his hand in the air. He didn't hit him yet. He had his hand in the air. And he wanted to hit him. So he's already a rasha. But, what happened? They said to him, wait, you're going to kill me just like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And they let, they went and said Lashon to Paro. They went to Paro and said Lashon but Moshe Rabbeinu had saved his life a day before. And that almost got Moshe Rabbeinu killed. Paro originally caught Moshe Put him for execution. They tried to cut his head off. His neck turned into as hard as stone. And then Hashem made a miracle where he put an angel instead of Moshe that looked like Moshe. Give Moshe time to run away. 
He went to Kush for 40 years, then eventually to Midian, and so on. But what happened here? Our forefathers, Yaakov, didn't say Lashon Hara for 21 years. His son, Joseph, didn't say Lashon Hara for 40 years. Because from the time he got sold to the time a, uh, his father died was almost 40 years. But then we have, just a couple of generations later, the Tam and Aviram, not only they say Lashon Hara, they say Lashon Hara, they almost get their savior, the one that's going to save them, killed. This is why a Jew is obligated to learn Torah. Torah of Avim. Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, mm-hmm. Moshe, Aaron, David, Shlomo, and so on. We have to learn Torah, we have to learn Gemara, we have to learn the Mishnah, we have to learn all the rules. Why? Because the only way we can have a future is if we connect to our past. If we don't connect to our past, there's no future, there's no Judaism. Nothing. We have nothing. We act like animals. The Dam and Aviram did not learn Torah. They did Avodah Zarah. They became, uh, you know. So, just a couple of generations, they go and, and do Lashon Hara, but the fir- a person that saved them, and he's the one that's going to save all of Amisad. They don't know that, obviously. But they almost got their own savior killed because of their own Lashon Hara. <laughs> so that's, that's the thing that we have to understand. People say Lashon Hara like it's no big deal. Oh no, he's this, he's that, he's an embarrassment. Ta, 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 all these things. They don't realize what Lashon Hara is. <clears throat> A few things about Lashon Hara, and then we start with the parasha. All of the most difficult diseases that come to mankind, this is Torah, this is not me saying this, this is in the Gemara. All of the most difficult diseases come to Lashon Hara. Someone says Lashon Hara, the punishment is the most difficult. It's the most difficult diseases. How do we know? What's the source? Who is one of the most holiest women in history? Miriam. Miriam. Miriam, Moses' sister. She was a prophet. We didn't have that many women prophets. We had seven women prophets that are listed that we have them in the Torah. She was a prophet. Miriam. Said Lashon Hara, which meant well. She actually intended it for it to be a good thing about Moshe Rabbeinu. And Hashem comes to her and says, How are you not scared talking about Moshe Rabbeinu? And he punishes her. What does he punish her with? Tzarat. Tzarat. It's a physical and spiritual disease. There's nothing really to compare it to today. Some people like to compare it to leprosy, but it's not really compared to leprosy other than having spots on your body. There's nothing in this world today that is that that's, you can compare it to, but from what I hear from, uh, from a reliable source, that there is actually a special hospital in Jerusalem uh, that has people that have tzara'at in it. I don't necessarily know if it's the same level or not, but it's incurable. Other than praying to Hashem to cure you, there's no cure. And there's not many people that have it, obviously. But who gets it? Lashon Hara. Lashon Hara gets Tzarat. And one of the things that would happen in those days, for somebody that did Lashon Hara, and got, you, would get, you would get Tzarat instantly. In those days, the reward and punishment were instant. Because you saw miracles, you know that Hashem was there, there was no doubt. So Hashem would punish right away. Somebody did Lashon Hara, they'd get punished with Tzarat. On top of that, when people would see him, he'd have to scream, Tzarat, Tzarat, Metzorah, Metzorah. Tameh, Tameh. I'm impure. So it's not like it, you could just, you know, be, uh, be, be you know, take him out of the camp. But if somebody would come close and he looks like a regular person, doesn't know that this person has Tzarat, he's, you know, he's covered. He doesn't know this person is uh, impure. That's Sarat. Mm-hmm. The person has to start screaming, no, tame, 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 I'm impure, I'm impure, I'm impure. How embarrassing is that? It's like somebody in the, in the middle of the, uh, you know, uh, New York saying, I have AIDS, I have AIDS, I have AIDS. <laughs> but you know, that's what it is. Okay, you have AIDS, let me scan, what can you do? It's, it's, too, it's too bad, you, you know, I guess, uh, unlucky, I don't know, made bad decisions in your life, whatever the reason is, Hashem decided to give it to you. But to announce it to the world is a different level. 
For what? For the Shemara. The Rambam, Rambam, all of our alachot are based on the Rambam. Sephardic, all alachot based on the Rambam. That's why we call ourselves Sephardic. Because Rambam mm-hmm. lived in Spain. And then he moved to Egypt. So in his respect, we call ourselves Sephardic. Rambam says someone that normally speaks Lashon Ara, has no share of the world to come. Because this, the, the punishment for Lashon Ara, a small one, is so big that if it's just part of you that you naturally speak Lashon Ara, there's no way in the world you can fix it. There's no, you have no share of the world to come. That's it. You're finished. So this is something we truly need to understand is that when you, before we make comments on the internet, before we go against any tzaddikim, before we do any of these things that are just truly foolish, it's not, you know, you got to think about, do you really believe in God? You have to question yourself. Do I really believe, you're writing the comment, do I really believe in God? Listen, the sad part about the story is that he's trying to teach something that's happening in our current generation. He still apologized if he offended anyone after it, after the whole balagan happened. But you know what? The funny thing is, as of course we all know, the Rashaim, the wicked, that are spreading this and doing this and, and trying to build their careers over this, what are they saying? No, we don't accept his apology. Wait, so Hashem, before he created the world, he created tshuva. So Hashem accepts apology, but you don't accept apology? You see, so it's not about what he said. It's for the wicked. It's for them to stop someone that's doing kiruv, stop someone that's bringing Jews back to God, and for the other wicked to try to build their careers. Why? Because they're losers. They're true losers. And they figured that in order for me to get to the next level, I have to step on someone. This is a similar mindset I used to see in the business world. Unfortunately, I still see it today. Of people that think that there's a limited amount of money in the world. So if someone opens a store next to me, he's stealing my panasa. If someone goes into the same profession as me, that's my customers. If someone made money, that money should have come to me. This nonsense type of mindset where they think there's a limited amount of anything in the world. There's more than enough. People think, no, don't bring all these immigrants to America. They'll take all the jobs. It's one of the most foolish things in history. First of all, America was built by immigrants. There's no such thing as an American, original American. American Indian, yes, but not American like what we think is American. And those American Indians, unfortunately, they killed a lot of most of them. Mm -hmm. But we celebrate Thanksgiving for some reason, as as if it's a great holiday, but... You know, Thanksgiving is, it's not, it's not, it's not it's really, it's yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's a legal holiday, but in reality, it's not, it's not supposed to be a celebration like people think. It's, uh, you know, not good things happen to get that day. A lot of people died. Anyway, um, when you have situations that are happening in the world today, but how about when you have situations that are happening in the world today where people are just spreading this Lashon as if it's a, as if they're saving the world. They think that if they tell people uh, their opinion, it's uh, the world is going to be a better place. Unfortunately, more times than not, the world would have been a better place if people stayed quiet. But people like to hear themselves talk. That's a natural thing. Um, so at the very least, if you think about what you say before you say it, maybe we'll, there'll be less damage. Um, yeah, yeah. A person is a uh, his life and death is decided by his tongue. The, the, the word, next word that he says. And uh, again, the thing that that irks me is that. A big part of the war that uh, has been from people that are supposed to be Torah observant Jews, and uh, they're not even close to being Torah observant Jews with all the lashon hara that they're doing. Um, and uh, I know it's a difficult topic. I know the Holocaust is a very touchy issue. Uh, <laughs> lashon hara. Uh, 
Someone came, I believe it was to the Chafetz Chaim, and he says, Kod Arav, I, uh, I want to fix Lashon Ara. How could I do it? Door to door. He says, come, come with me. Get the pillow. Bring the pillow. Back in those days, pillows were full of feathers. So said, bring, bring the pillow with me. He go, they go to the roof. The rabbi takes the pillow, rips it, and t- throws all the feathers out of the pillow, on, you know, from the roof, and, you know, the wind takes them everywhere. The guy is looking, okay, great, the rabbi knows what he's doing. The rabbi says, okay, go gather all the, all the, uh, all the feathers. That's how you fix the Shonara. Okay. He said, no. Exactly. So the guy, guy realized right away just what Shalom realized. You can't. Someone says Lashon Ara, it's virtually impossible to fix it because you don't know where it reached. You don't, the only way you can fix it is if you reach every person that that Lashon Ara reached and you say, listen, what I said is wrong. Ta, 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 ta. But the reality is you don't know how far it reached. Of course, back in those days, there's one one of the uh, major sages in the days of the Rambam. Rambam, when he first came out with his work, a lot of people went against him. The Gedolei Ado, the big rabbis of those days, went against him. They would, they would burn his books. but Because they thought that he's uh, involved with too much secular knowledge, the knowledge of the Greeks. Yeah. Maybe uh, it's, it's not Torah, maybe this, maybe that. They questioned him. But in those days, people were so scared... They'd literally, they'd burn your book. But it's not like today, you burn a book, it's no big deal, you print another 500,000 in 10 minutes. In those days, every book was handwritten. <coughs> so if he wrote one book, he, you know, he wrote 10 of them, 20 of them, 100 of them, and gave him one to each city, and that's it. There's no, like, reserve copies. So when you burn books, it's a big deal. Mm-hmm. So they would burn books, uh, burn his books, but then they realized eventually that the Rambam not only was right about what he says, but he was also the do-a-do. He was bigger than all of them. So one of these sages, I forget his name, spent the rest of his life, which was another 30-something years, going from city to city, synagogue to synagogue, community to community, saying everything that Rambam says is emet, I made a mistake, I did Lashon Ara, and this is a giant rabbi. This is not like a me, a tiny little guy in the corner. Uh, barely anybody knows him. This is a giant rabbi, one of the biggest rabbis in the world. He's going from community to community. Why? We said Lashonara about the Rambam, and he has to fix it. And why is he going to every city? Because I don't know where the Lashonara, you know, where it reached. I did it in my community, but maybe somebody was visiting. He went to a different community. That guy had somebody else that was visiting. He went to different. So he said, the rest of my life, he went from community to community to fix the lesson So when somebody makes a comment on the internet, somebody makes a video on the internet, somebody does things like that, they have to realize there's no end. There's no end. So it's better to just be quiet. It's hard for us to be quiet today, but it's that's why uh, that's why Shem gave us a limited amount of words. You come to this world. You have a limited amount of words that you're able to say if it's not Torah. You have, there's a cap of how many words you can say in your lifetime. And if, if someone that likes to talk but it's not Torah, pretty much as they're talking, they're cutting their own life shorter. One of the, one of the reasons we're learning today is because a lot of the stuff people talk about today is Lashon Allah. So Hashem says, to limit your sins, I <laughs> give you less words. That's why we have one mouth and uh, two ears. Rabbi May asked Hashem, why don't you have two mouths? Two. He says, look how much bad comes out of the one. You want me to give you two? So that's that's the that's number one. The first thing we need to understand is that it's a uh, it's a sad sad situation, but it's also the good news is that this is actually brings us one step closer to Mashiach, one step closer to the uh, the end. Because if you see the situation that's happening in the world, the prophecies one after another are coming true. The war, World War, the silent World War Three, is getting more and more serious. I, uh, Iran threatened Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia with war. 
Mm-hmm. You know, the uh, the situation happening in Turkey is not getting easier. The situation happening in Syria is not getting easier. The situation happening in, in the United States is not getting easier. Obama, yeah. The situation in Israel is not getting easier. Everything is getting worse. The world is boiling, and is, at any minute, somebody's going to pull a trigger, and we have a whole lot of balagan. So, Bezat Hashem, we will be ready with enough Torah where when the Mashiach shows up, we can say, okay, you know what? This guy's worth it. This guy's worth it. This guy's worth it. Let's go. Save. We don't have Torah. We have nothing to say. If Mashiach shows up, you didn't learn Torah. You didn't do mitzvot. What are you going to say? It's nothing to say. So, that's, that's, the, that's the end of that. Uh, moving into this parasha. So, last week, parasha Shmot, after Moshe Rabbeinu came and to Paro, asked him to free Am Yisrael. Paro said, who is this Hashem? I don't know this Hashem. And uh, made the situation much worse for Am Yisrael. Took away their uh, their straw, so they said that you are there, they could gather their own straw. They're only bringing this guy because they're lazy. They made things much more difficult for them. And uh, Moshe came to... Uh, came to Paro, came to, uh, I'm sorry, came to Hashem, and said that, uh, you know, why did you, uh, why did you do this? You know, why did you, not only why did you do this to Am Yisrael, but why did you have me be the facilitator, be the tool that led to so much bad for Am Yisrael? I'm going to ask for a thing. So, I'm going to ask for a thing. Hashem, and this week's parasha rebukes him. Vaidaber Elohim el Moshe, vayomer elav ani Adonai. If you look throughout all of the Torah, every time it says Hashem spoke to Moshe, it says vaidaber Adonai el Moshe. Here is the only time in the entire Torah it says vaidaber Elohim el Moshe. Elohim is judgment, whereas Adonai is mercy. So here, Hashem is rebuking <laughs> Moshe. He's saying, Vaera, El Avraham, El Yitzchak, Ve'el Yaakov, Ve'el Shaddai, Ushmi Adonai. He says, I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, as El Shaddai. But with my name, Hashem, I did not make myself known to them. He says, you're the only one I ever did that with. And already you're questioning me? <clears throat> so a few things. First off, first question is, why didn't Hashem just, if you wanted to take us out of Egypt, why didn't just kill all the Egyptians, one, two, three, just like he created the world in an instant? So we said, Hashem really created the world in an instant. He didn't take six days to create the world. It was instantly created. Just over six days, he put the pieces together. To give us a week so we could celebrate the Shabbat and have a feeling like he had on the seventh day. That's why Shabbat is Shabbat. That's why it's a gift. So when someone knows that Hashem pretty much minimized and limited himself to give you a present, so when we don't keep Shabbat, we're being unappreciative of this present. It's a very ungrateful behavior. That's why he gets so angry. And that's why the punishment for Bechal <coughs> Shabbat is worse than any punishment in the entire Torah. Simple as it gets. So now, since Hashem created the world in an instant, if He wanted to free us out of Egypt, why didn't He just kill all the Egyptians? And say, okay, go. Go to Israel. Why go through this whole balagan of talking to Paro, bringing the one plague and the second plague and the third plague and the fourth plague and the fifth plague, a year worth of plagues. Each plague was uh, one week. The plague itself was one week. And in three weeks, preparing Paro for the next one, pretty much. But the plague itself only was a week. Only, but, you know, in those days, obviously, it's, uh, it was torture for, for a week. But again, if Hashem wanted to get us out of Egypt, why the plagues? Why all of this stuff? Just kill all the Egyptians, and then let us go. So that's the first question. Second question, throughout all of this parasha, and throughout the entire Torah moving forward from here, you are constantly going to hear Ani Adonai. 
Hashem is reminding us who he is. What's his name? Hashem. At the end of that, but at the end of it, Ani Hashem. He's constantly reminding us, Ani Hashem, Ani Hashem, Ani Hashem. Okay, I know, your voice is, the whole world can hear your voice. I get it, you're Hashem. You're reminding me here. He's talking to Moshe Rabbeinu over here. But you Ani Hashem. And throughout this parasha, he's constantly reminding Moshe and Aaron, Ani Hashem, Ani Hashem, Ani Hashem. He's reminding Paro, Ani Hashem. So anybody think about the first one? Because there's actually a verse that answers the first one. It's an easy question. First well, question. Why, why did Hashem have the plagues? Easy come, easy go. No, <laughs> no they probably have to... <coughs> probably didn't fulfill the time that they needed to spend time in Egypt, no? No, but... It's, to it's, shorten the time. Like that you made it more difficult to shorten the time, yes. But why did he do the whole plague? Okay, so after let's say they reached the time, okay, he made it really difficult for them. Instead of four hundred years, it was two hundred years, two hundred ten years. Fine. So that's what you're saying. Great. But still, why another year worth of plagues? Why not? Okay, so you cut the time. We suffered. So another addition to what he says to get them to get a little become a little more holy. Because if you stop right there, most of the Jews would be dead. Most of the Jews did end up dying, by the way. Right. Only only twenty percent. But one of the things also to know is that Hashem was going to make his name memorable until the end of time. And in order for him to make it memorable, he had to have the plagues. If he would have just freed them within one, two, three, or four generations, it would have been forgotten. People do not keep mitzvot because of miracles. People that Hashem saved their life do not stay religious because of the miracle that He gave them. They stay religious if they keep learning Torah and they do good things. Am Yisrael did not stay religious because they saw Hashem's words in, in the sky and they saw the Ten Commandments, they saw the Ten Plagues, they saw all of these things. Yeah, hey, uh, <laughs> uh, does not stay religious because of a uh, of the miracles. Am Yisrael stayed religious because of Torah. Now Hashem wanted to make sure that this situation was going to be memorable, and the only way to do it is by having the plagues. Because by having these plagues, the entire world would know what happened. Not just the Jews. Because each plague showed that Hashem is above nature, Hashem is in control of everything, and Hashem cares and monitors and decides everything. The smallest details, Hashem cares. If you do Netilat Yadayim or not, Hashem cares. He's paying attention to it. People are saying, no, why do I care if Hashem if I do Mithyot Yadayim or not? Why does Hashem care if I do a bracha after I eat an apple? Why does Hashem care if I keep Shabbat or not? He cares. Exactly. So he made it a memorable event because this is something that could not be forgotten. That the plagues were something that the entire world knew, that even the Goim wrote about it. There's actually uh, museums that have a, uh, some of the records of how an Egyptian, an Egyptian uh, uh, media, a uh, new, uh, news reporter wrote about the ten plagues. He hated Jews, this Egyptian. I forget his name. He hated Jews. But he wrote, the streets are full of blood, can't drink any water, streets are full of frogs, streets are full of lice. He wrote everything that we have in the Torah, it's by an Egyptian wrote this. An Egyptian newspaper. This is one of the best proofs for the Torah showing how these things happened, but even another proof that's good to know, of proof of how in the other religions, for example, in a, uh, in um, Christianity, the main figure is Jesus. But what a lot of people don't realize is that other than the New Testament, there's no proof he ever existed. Because Christianity started between 70 to 300 years after he died. Which means that everyone that wrote the book never knew him, never met him. 
That's why all the pictures that are out, the famous pictures that people put, no one knows if that's what he looks like or not. So if somebody tells you, no, I had a near-death experience and I saw him, how do you know it's him? Sure. Why? It's because it's a picture on your wall. How do you know it's him? Maybe it's just a Jew that lived in that time. Maybe it's just somebody, a homeless guy. How do you know it's him? So, the interesting thing is that at the time he supposedly lived, 2,000 years ago, there's not one book one newspaper, one clip, one line, anything mentioning his name at all, mentioning that he even existed. Now, if you're telling me somebody made miracles, walked on water, brought back the dead, did this, did that, somebody would write about it. Yep. Somebody, somebody would write something. This is, this is 1,500 years almost after, the, after we, uh, this whole event that we're reading about in Apostle Bayerah. The Egyptians that hated us wrote about the ten plagues. So then, I, so somebody over there is not going to write about somebody that's curing the uh, the dead. What does that say? That is there a record that you can see that somebody wrote the ten plagues back in those days? Yeah, yeah, it's in a museum. It's in a museum. There's a there's you could look it up online also. There's a uh, there's a uh, I forget his name, but it's a um, famous Egyptian writer of that time that literally wrote. Everything that was happening at that time, people can't eat, there's animals, everything that happened, everything that we see in the Torah, he, he wrote. Knows, he knows. That's after the fact or during? During, during the whole thing. Oh, they found it? Yeah, they have it now, they have it now, but he, he wrote it in those days, it's an artifact, it's something from, from a long time ago. So they have it, and you can find it online, it's no problem, I, I, don't, I just don't remember the guy's name. Um, but they, uh, <coughs> no, no, this is one of the best proofs... Yeah. For for our Torah because it's coming from a third party source. So if I were told you, listen, some Jew wrote something, because okay, it's another Jew. He's trying to maybe you know it's not a hundred percent, you know it's not, it doesn't sell you a hundred percent. But if I tell you an Egyptian enemy wrote it, that's worth a few dollars, right? So. Mm-hmm. Even even yeah, that's the thing. In in in, in Morocco, even the Arabs knew He knows. Knew the <coughs> <Arabs> <coughs> Yeah, yeah, the Arabs yeah. respected. Actually, that's what uh, yeah. also it's, Arabs so, during uh, Shabbat. Yeah. They would, you know, obviously, they're not. They, they, don't, they can't keep Shabbat. They don't keep Shabbat. But if they would see Jews, they would hide the cigarettes. Like, they would be smoking, but they would hide the cigarettes out of respect for the Jews. Today, unfortunately, it's not the same. The Jews are still smoking in your face. Hey, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. How are you doing? Oh, you want to come to the beach? So, so times have changed a little bit. <laughs> So anyway, we uh, we have this pasha starts. This pasha has the seven plagues, and uh, to to finalize the question, to finalize the answer of, of this one question of why Hashem continues to remind us that He is Hashem, Rashi says this term where He constantly reminds that He is Hashem. Is to remind us he's remi- that he is trustworthy. Whatever he says, it's going to happen. When you say Amen, Amen is an acronym. El Melech Neeman. God, the King, that's trustworthy. Whatever he says, it's going to happen. If he says there's Allah Abba, there's Allah Abba. If he says there's Geinom, there's Geinom. If he says you're going to get reward, you're going to get reward. If he says there's punishment, there's punishment. So Rashi says, anytime he says, Ani Hashem, it says, I'm trustworthy, and there's reward, and there's punishment. <clears throat> and that's what you need to know, that based on whatever's happening here, whatever's happening in the future, whatever happened in the past, there's going to be a reward or a punishment for whatever happened. Why? Because Ani Hashem. I'm reliable and whatever I said is going to happen. I can't change my mind. When Hashem wrote the Torah, He obligated Himself. He gave rules to Himself. Why? Because He could do anything. He could say, listen, Moshe Rabbeinu was a tzaddik, Abraham Avinu was a tzaddik, Yitzchak was a tzaddik, David was a tzaddik, everybody was a tzaddikim, Dolom Gan Eden. 
a little shmuli over here. Not so much, but he's such a funny guy. He's one of my creations. Let him pass. Let him pass. Can't do it. Why? Because you wrote the Torah. And he says, Ani Hashem. I'm trustworthy. If I say Shmuley because I love you, I'm going to let you pass, I'm no longer Hashem. Makes me a liar. Can't be. Makes a contradiction in my Torah. Can't do it. So anyone that thinks that once they get the Shemaim, they're going to figure it out up there, they can convince Hashem to, to not be Hashem, it goes against the Torah. So, he tells, he tells uh, Moshe, I also heard the cries of Israel. What do you mean I also heard? Of course I, of course we know that you, you heard the cries of Israel. Why, uh, why is it a big deal that uh, he says? He's trying to tell us, when Am Yisrael is suffering, I'm with them during that time. I'm suffering with them. I'm crying with them. So don't think that I'm just a Shem. I'm just a king that's far away. I'm with you. Excuse me, in the good and the bad. And then he gives us four words of how he's going to, uh, how the salvation is going to work. It says, Ve'otzeti, ve'ga'alti, ve'itzalti, ve'lakachti. It says, I shall take you out, I shall redeem you, I shall rescue you, and I shall uh, take you for me as a people. So it's four ways of how, he's go how the salvation is going to work. This is actually why we have four cups during Pesach. We drink four cups during the Seder. It's, one represents each one of these words, each way of the salvation, how it worked. And then he says something that's one of the rules of Judaism and also one of the rules of the Torah that most people don't necessarily work on getting to, which is, I shall take you, I shall take you to me for a people, and I shall be a God to you, and you shall know that I am Hashem, your God. Now, most people in other religions, they, they constantly talk about how you need to believe, you need to believe in God, you need to love God, you need to believe in God. There's only one or two areas in the entire Torah, in the entire Tanakh even, that Hashem says you have to believe in me. It's always you have to know me. Meaning that a person needs to investigate the Torah and the life around him with enough energy, passion, and ambition to arrive at knowledge of Hashem, not belief in Hashem. Knowing for sure that Hashem exists. Knowing for sure that Hashem is not only exists, but is involved in every single thing that you do in your life. One way that I've done it personally is look at science. There's a lot of interesting scientific facts that show you that there's no possible way that the world was an accident. One example that most people take for granted is rain. Rain. You see rain. Most people that see rain, they don't say, oh, wow, it's a miracle. It's a yofi. What a miracle. No one says that. Who says that? You see rain, you say, it's a, it's, it's, what a miracle? You don't say it's a miracle, right? Right? You say it's a miracle, Tomo? When you see rain, you see it's a miracle? No. It's over. Rainbow is different. We already know. Rain, rain, you see rain. Anyone here see rain and say, wow, what a miracle. Rain happened? No, right? Especially not in Boca Raton because it rains every day. Good, I woke him up. <laughs> now, now no rain. <laughs> so what's, miracle, what's, what's one of many miracles of rain? One of many miracles that's logical. Yeah, that's one of them. But another thing, just the rain itself. Rain, there's, when it drops all the way from the Shemaim, from the clouds, every drop that drops never touches a second drop. No two drops ever touch each other. Ever. If there's wind, all the drops go to the right. All the drops go to the left. There's never two drops that will ever touch each other in air. Ever. Why is that such a big deal? Why is it such a miracle? Scientific fact. Scientific fact. I didn't make it up. Trust me, I'm not that uh, smart. Scientific. Scientific fact. So why, why, why is it such a big deal that no two drops ever, ever touch each other? 
Wait. So many drops. But I will wait, so it's gonna be cool. Because if two drops touch each other, that means that three drops can touch each other. If three drops can drop touch each other, that means that a thousand or a million drops can touch each other over time. So now when you go outside and you put your little umbrella, you're thinking there's a few drops, but instead there's four thousand pounds or gallons of water dropping on you as one drop, that's you're dead on the spot. Chas People pay a lot of money for that sometimes. <laughs> so the key here is that we, it's rain out there, even when there's, even when there's uh, heavy rain out there, you go, you walk out, it doesn't hurt, nothing. You walk outside, you get wet, it's a little annoying, unless you like rain, that's it, no problem. But if two drops will touch each other, every time it would rain, would literally mean a world destruction. The entire world would be destroyed with one rain. Exactly. How did Noah, how did the whole thing of the flood happen with Noah? Hashem removed one of the stars, one of the comets. Comets are all one, one big giant uh, cube of ice. That's what a comet is. It's ice. Mm -hmm. And he moved it from its place and put it where we closer to the sun where all the water would come to the earth. And it flooded the earth. So, the looking at things like this, you see Hashem in the middle of creation. Seeing things like the beauty of fruits, we've talked about this in the past. You look at a fruit, what can you possibly learn from a fruit? Hashem says, we have to learn from everything. You see Hashem's creation, and you see the intelligent design in everything. If you want to see the most beautiful part of a fruit, you cut it in half. Every fruit, whether it's a banana, an apple, uh, even a vegetable like a, uh, a um, tomato, anything. If you cut it in half, you can see pretty much all parts of the fruit. You can see the outer shell, whether the shell or peel. Then you can see the, uh, the body. And you see the seeds. And usually around the seeds, there's protection. Like in an apple, there's like a, a hard part that protects the seeds. So when you cut a fruit in half, you see all of them at the same time. Interesting thing about a fruit or a vegetable is that as soon as you peel it, just a little bit, what happens? If you take an apple, you peel it a little bit. What happens? It becomes brown. It becomes brown, right? What, what can you possibly learn from, from an apple that turns brown? Apple knows that he came to this world to be eaten. But at the same token, he's also here to serve Hashem. One of the things that Hashem hates is zima. Is a, um, immodesty, prostitution, things that are not, uh, that are not uh, kosher in the Jewish world. Women are supposed to be modest. Men are supposed to be modest. The fruit is here to teach us. He says, listen, I came to this world with clothes on. The apple came here with clothes on. As soon as you take off a peel, you take removing a part of my clothes. I'm shy. I'm not supposed to be like this. So it becomes darker. Replaces the peel. So if an apple is worried about modesty, why aren't women today worried about modesty? Because they're not paying attention to the apple. So there's many, many scientific things that you can learn. There's many things that you could see in the world that really would change your view of the world. And that's why Hashem says, Vayadatim. You need to know that I am Hashem, not believe. There's many ways to arrive at knowledge of Hashem. Moving on. After, uh, after this whole thing happens, you have a... Uh, Hashem rebukes him and uh, in so many words... He says, don't worry, I'm going to, free. now you will see what I will do, I'll free them. Now this whole thing happened, and uh, Hashem is pretty much telling him that in, in, uh, in so many words, or the Midrash is telling us that in so many words, just like you were saying before, is that in order for us to cut the time in half, the Egyptians already did part of that work by making us suffer more than it was supposed to. But, in order to speed even the last uh, few years up, Hashem made Pao make our life even more difficult. So that cut, that made it time right now to bring the Geula. One of the reasons why we read this parasha several times during the year, during Pesach, now, and so on, is because it says that in the, in the end of times, the... Uh, 
things that happen in Egypt are going to happen again. They're going to be even bigger. So in essence, you're almost reading. You're reading just like you're reading the past. You're also reading the future when you read this parasha and the next one, the whole Exodus, the Matan Torah, everything. So after this, it is a segue. This this parasha segues into something else where it says it tells us about the lineage of Am Yisrael who came to uh, who came to Egypt. Uh, it talks about Ever Hashem Bet Avotam Bnei Reuven Bechol Israel Chanoch. It talks about who came to Israel, who came to uh, to Egypt, the uh, tribe of Reuven, the tribe of uh, Levi, Shimon, uh, and then it talks about why is it talking about the, the Levi because it talks about how, where Moshe and Aaron came from. It says uh, you know uh, one of the uh, sons of. Uh, one of the descendants of Levi is Amram. Amram was the uh, father of Moshe. And then it says, "Vayikach Amram et Yochev et Dodato lo leisha vateled lo et Aaron ve et Moshe ushne chaye Amram sheva ushlosh ushloshim meat shana." Says Amram took his aunt Yochevet. As wife, and she bore him Aaron and Moshe. The years of Amram were 137 years. Why is it important for us to know that Amram and Yochevet were related? She was his aunt. Why is it important for, for the Torah to mention to us that she was his aunt? Because when they receive the Torah and they have to break their marriage. So the, 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 the most allowed. important so, parents. Right. Right. It's not allowed. It's not allowed to. Uh, an aunt is not allowed to marry her. Uh, her nephew. So it shows that the rules apply to everyone. As soon as we got the Torah, Moshe came down with the Torah. The first thing he said, "Abba, Ima, you have to get divorced. No special, no no grandfathering in it." Mm-hmm. After that, it mentions that uh, it says, "Ve'ikach Aaron et Elisheva bat Aminadav achot, nachshon lo leisha v'tered lo et Nadav v'et Aviu v'et et Elazar v'et Itamar." It says these are the uh, sons of Aaron. Aaron married uh, Elisheva, and she bore him Nadav, Aviu, Elazar, and Itamar. Now, if we fast forward the parashot, we know that Nadav and Aviu were the very famous story that they Hashem punished them. They came into Kodesh Kodeshim in a time that Hashem did not permit them to go and Hashem punished them. But also the Gemara says that Nadav and Aviyah were bigger than Moshe and Aaron. They were bigger. Bigger, bigger than Moshe and Aaron and Hashem punished them and killed them both. After that it says the sons of Korach Asir and Kana and Abiyasaf. These were the sons of Korah. Why? Why is there a connection here? Why is there a connection here? Oh, somewhere in a second. And then it says, it gets to Moshe and Aaron. It says, the uh, Moshe and Aaron. These were the ones that spoke to Paro, the king of Egypt. To take the children of Israel out of Egypt. This was Moshe and Aaron. It says just in this Moshe and Aaron that we're mentioning here about the descendants of, of uh, Shevet Levi. It's the same Moshe and Aaron that spoke to Hashem and he told him to take him out. He said to take uh, uh, Israel out of Egypt. They spoke to Paro. It's the same Moshe and Aaron. No different Moshe and Aaron. So what's this? This is all on the same page. All in essence the same paragraph. It's four very critical points. First of all, the uh, Torah is telling us that in order for you to learn Torah, you have to understand, and, and to comply with the Torah, you have to understand, number one, there's no bias. There's no bias by Hashem. Hashem does not make special rules for anyone. Torah is black and white. This generation, less than the last generation. No, in the last generation, they didn't have cars, so maybe that's why we're allowed to drive on Shabbat. Oh no, in the old days everyone wore long dresses and it was normal. Today it's not normal, so you can wear short dresses. All of these things that people say, it's all complete nonsense. 
Torah that we have today is the same Torah, same rules that we have 3,300 years ago. Hashem did not tell us that Torah changes. There's no special rule. There's certain things that adapt to the times, of course, because we didn't have electricity back then, so there's halachot that had to adapt to the times, but as far as the basic foundation of Torah, the basic rules of Torah stay the same. Modesty stays the same. The uh, the halav uh, uh, and the basal stays the same. Milk and meat stays the same. Shabbat stays the same. All of these basic foundation of Judaism stays the same. So you can't say no because of the old generation they couldn't do it. Now it's allowed. It's all nonsense. He didn't specify back in the day. Oh, you cannot do uh, on Shabbat, for example. He said not ebaru esh. As is lo yam echonik ozei. If shara yala asikim, ayom efshar. Yeah, but the thing is, Esh, the car is, is Esh. That's what I'm saying. So these people, they're saying, oh, things are changed. No, nothing changed. The same thing. It's just that this is another way to use Esh. Yeah, it's, an, it's another way to use fire. Whether you use fire in a, uh, a little uh, mangale, you're making barbecue for yourself, or you use it in the car, it's the same thing. You use it in a, it's, just, it's, it's fire. Fire is fire. It doesn't matter how you light it. So the first thing he's telling you is that, listen, the Torah doesn't have any bias. One way that you know is from the marriage of the most important person that ever lived, most important prophet that ever lived, Moshe Rabbeinu, his parents had to get divorced on day one that we got Torah. Hey, we're mentioning over here. They're the parents of the most important prophet and his brother, the Kohen. The Kohen tribe, pretty much all the Kohen, mm -hmm. we got Kohen, and come from Aaron. Mm -hmm. Two most important people, their parents had to get divorced. Why? Because the Torah doesn't have any bias. Second thing, the um, sons of Aaron and the sons of Korach. Why is there a connection? Sons of, uh, of Korach. Korach was a Rasha, went against a, uh, you know, originally was a Sadiq that did, uh, you know, went against, uh, went against Moshe, did a Machloket. Unfortunately, like some of the rabbis today that are going against uh, Mizrahi, where maybe they were Tzadikim before they, the Lashon Allah came out of their, their mouth like a sewer, maybe they weren't, but the point is, is that there's a lot of Machloket in the world today. He says, Korach made a big machloket, but his sons in the last minute did tshuva. Tshuva is available. The sons of Korach did tshuva in the last minute. That's why they didn't get killed. That's why they got saved. That's why in Perkei Teilim, the several Teilim, it says, Bnei Korach. We're saying, we're saying, we're saying, so we're, we're talking about the sons of Korach. We're honoring them. Why we're honoring them? Because they did tshuva. Tshuva is a very high level. But if you're one of these people says, no, 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 but my Saba, my, my grandfather was a, was a tzaddik. Yeah. My grandfather was a big rabbi. Yeah. Oh, then you're making a mistake that Nadav and Aviu said. They said, listen, why do we need, we can't find a woman that's good enough for us. Mm. Our father is our own. Our uncle is mm. Moshe. Mm. Well, what do we need? There's no woman that can, and we're tzaddikim ourselves. There's no woman that's good enough for us. You rely on your grandfather? Rasha, Hashem punishes you. Can't do that. The Dabar Aviu made that mistake. And then it summarizes with make sure you know that all of these descendants, you know this story comes from the same people, there's no mistakes. Same Moshe and Aaron, the descendants from Levi, everything. It's the same thing as it was in the previous page, the previous parasha. Nothing changed. Not like the New Testament where in one place it says 25 names of how somehow Joseph is connected to King David because they want to prove that JC is somehow connected to David. So they're saying that Joseph is connected to David, but at the same token, they're saying that Joseph is not his father. They're saying God is his father. So why Joseph matters doesn't really make a difference. But on one page, in one book, in the New Testament, it says 25 names. David, da, 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 gets to Joseph. On another book, it says another 25 names, but the 25 names are different names. It's connected to the... There's contradiction between the two. To the Miriam. There's contradiction between the two. Why? Because it's man-made. It's connected to... Torah is telling you here, this is the same Moshe and Aaron. What, same Moshe and Aaron you heard in the previous page, the previous parasha, the next parasha, nothing changes. The same heritage, you see the same names over and over again. Miriam, the, the sister of uh, Moshe. Okay, but now, now that, now that, uh, can, can exactly, Miriam, they're saying they, uh, they think that, uh, yeah, Miriam, the, the mother of Jesus, is the, uh, 
is the uh, Moshe's uh, sister. That's what the Quran says, not the New Testament. Oh, the Quran. The Quran says it. The Quran says that Miriam, the uh, the mother of Jesus, is also Moshe Rabbeinu's sister, even though they lived about fifteen hundred years difference, if he even lived at all. But anyway, so Torah tells you in this page, in this paragraph. Now that you know, there's no there's no special exceptions. There's no contradictions. You can't rely on Saba and Safta. You can always do tshuva. It's never too late. Just like the Bnei Korach. Now you know this foundation of the rules. Now the Exodus can start. Now you can get to Torah. You have all these rules here. So... What do you need? What do you need? What are you going to tell me? I'm interrupting your thoughts. One of the most difficult things for, for, for speaking is uh, is to keep your uh, train of thought and go to a no, direction. I want to make sure that our guest here gets everything he needs. Yeah, yeah, he's he's he feels comfortable. So anyway, so now it says the, the plagues are obviously going to start. Hashem is telling uh, Moshe I just ask you one to, question. To, to, yeah. What was the thing that had to happen before the redemption started? I missed that part. Everything I just said for the last 20 minutes? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, so you have to, it talks about the lineage, it connects to the uh, lineage. Okay, uh, yeah, okay. Lineage okay. of the, of the, uh, of the uh, tribes. Then it talks about, it mentions specific names. Then it says... Uh, so it had, that had, I read that last night, that had to... Yeah, they had to state that before the redemption starts. It says it in the Torah. Not necessarily that they had to state that. It's that it's telling, it's teaching us. The Torah is more for us than it is for them. Yeah. It's teaching us that there's no contradictions in the Torah. There's no special exceptions. Sure, sure, sure. There's no she's allowed to be modest, but no, since she went to a different school, she's okay not for her to be modest. There's no special exceptions. Yeah. Because it's saying that you know Moshe's uh, parents, his own parents, had to get divorced as soon as we got the Torah. Why? Because they were, she was his aunt. Not allowed to marry your aunt. So, different things like that, that a, uh, it's telling us there's certain rules that you need to know. Now, once you know these rules, now we can move forward. That's my chidush as far as connecting the few. But of course, I'm sure that Chazal thought about this 500 different ways before I thought about it. I just connected a few of guys. Uh, anyway, moving forward, the redemption can start. Um, the... Uh, Moshe and Aaron come to uh, to Egypt, come to Paro. Paro was known to have lions at his gates, and everyone was scared of them. But and, but uh, the lions were scared of uh, Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron. So every time he would come, they would become like his puppies, and they would come with him, and all these lions would come with him into Paro's kingdom. And Paro was like, How, "Who will let these people in?" Every time you see Paro saying. Uh, uh, he sees uh, Moshe, he's always surprised to see him in the beginning, before the plague started. Because, how, how did he come in? And he sees all these big lions coming in with him. This is teaching us, This one also we learn this from the book of Daniel, is that animals in general are scared of humans. So how do you explain when a lion attacks a person or a shark attacks a person? That's when that person does not look like a human being to that animal. But an animal has different vision than human beings. They see more than we do. That's why sometimes you'll see a dog barking at nothing. Sometimes you see a bar you know, dog outside or inside the house and he's just barking at the wall for an hour. Or a cat is running away for some reason. Or you see different animals acting strange. Why? Because they see spirits. They see different things than we do. They have a different vision than we do. So a human being that has Torah and mitzvot, to them looks like a human being. A human being that has no Torah and mitzvot, to them looks like an animal. That's why when Daniel was thrown into the dungeon with the lions, the lions became his friends. They were all scared of him. They became his little puppies. Even though he was there for a few days, they never touched him. But then as soon as they threw the guy that caused uh, uh, Daniel to be thrown in the dungeon... They ate him while he was still in the air. Why? Because he didn't look human to them. So this is one of the things. The second thing is, is that Hashem is telling Moshe, 
make sure to bring your mate, bring your staff with you, the special staff that we learned about last week. One thing that I forgot to mention to you guys about the staff is there's a few interesting facts about the staff. The uh, staff was uh, a uh, sapphire, completely sapphire, or sapphire-like, and it was 40 sa'a. The weight of the uh, of the staff is 40 sa'a. Uh, sa'a, 40 sa'a is 672 pounds. What? 672 pounds. Sure. 40? 40 times 600? And it made of stone. Not 40 times 600. 40 sa'a is equals 672 ah, pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he picked it up with his hand. Yeah, one hand. With it, yeah. One hand. Yeah. 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 He was big. Yeah. Moses was big. Most big. Uh, so, Moses. Uh, oh, man. so how did he get into, so man. So how did he get into Paro's uh, palace? What? He Moshe. How did he get in? Oh, the door opened for him. Yeah, Moshe, no, yeah, whenever Moshe would come in, they would just come in. No, no, but the, I'm saying the door would open because the door was small for Paro. Right? No, now you're talking about uh, the previous Paro that was only a mile and a half, and Yaakov when he went inside ah, the yeah, wall. Okay. But this Paro, from what I know, is normal size, made a, is and he came inside normally. They remodeled? <laughs> they remodeled, yeah. <laughs> so, uh... Yaakov. <laughs> So it's made of stone. So this uh, sapphire is a stone. Yeah, yeah. Six hundred seventy-two pounds, big, big. Uh, it was ten amot. Stone. Ten amot. Yes, and it also had inscription on it. It had Hashem's real name on it. It also had the names of our patriarchs of Rami Tzach and Yaakov. It also had the Rashi Tavot, the first letter of each one of the plagues. Dam, Tzfardea, Kinin, Barad, all of the plagues that we had in Egypt, it had on there also. Gamesh is a mashu, ben a mate shelo, the mat, mashaya la. Okay, so what's that? So what happens? So now, now Moshe Rabbeinu comes to Paro and uh, he tells him, listen, for, let, let my people go, let, you know, and so on, let us go into the wilderness to serve our God for three days and we'll come back. And uh, Paro obviously doesn't want to do it. And uh, then there's this whole event where uh, Moshe is trying to show Paro that uh, he's a messenger of God and not just a magician. And uh, actually, uh, Aaron, it's Aaron's staff, not Moshe's staff, that gets thrown on the floor and it turns into a snake. The reason why uh, it's not it's not Moshe's staff is because Moshe's staff was holy, they didn't want anyone to disrespect it. So they used Aaron's staff, was thrown on the floor and turned into a snake. So then... Uh, Paro says, well, what's the big deal? So he brings his, his wizards, his necromancers, Khatumim, and they all throw their sticks on the floor. Also turns into a snake. Hashem says, the, uh, tor- the Ma says that they would say, ten levels of uh, Tum'ah that came to this world that uh, would allow people to do uh, different magic based on Tum'ah. And nine of them came to Egypt. It had a lot of, uh, you know, there were wizards and, and people that were able had to use black magic in Egypt. So, uh, anyway, so what's the big deal? So then, Aaron grabs the, his own stick and turns back into a stick. And then he throws it again on the floor, but it stays a stick. But then the stick swallows the snakes. Oh. And stays the same size. If it was, if his stick would turn into a snake and the snake would eat snakes, it wouldn't be such a big deal. They would just think it's just some type of... But now it was a stick eating the snakes <laughs> and the stick would stay the same same thing. wouldn't change. So that's when Paro became worried. He's like, if this stick ate 10 snakes right now without getting bigger, maybe it could eat me, maybe it could eat all of Egypt. This special stick they have. <laughs> so first plague is these plagues. We went over it last year. In last year's shul, we went over the parashot. But each one of these plagues, if you look into it, each one of these plagues was a measure-for-measure uh, measure punishment from Hashem. So the first thing that uh, Hashem told uh, uh, Moshe is, Lech el paro ba-boker. Hine yotzea maimah v'nitzavta likrato. 
Hashem said to Moses, uh, Paul's heart is stubborn. He has refused, um, refused to send the people. Go to Pharaoh in the morning. Behold, he goes out to the water. Why in the morning? I said it last week. No, who was paying attention last week? Why go in the morning? Why not go in the afternoon right now? Because nobody wants. Number one, number two. Okay. Right. So, Paro. Everybody sleep. Paro told everyone that he's a god. So he helped. So he told him, I'm a god. The way I prove that I'm a god is by I don't go to the bathroom. I don't have to. Uh, I don't have to go to the bathroom. But I have a rule. He made a law that at a certain hour in the morning, no one's allowed to go outside. So he would go to the Nile River. And he would, uh, he would do his thing over there. So he also told everyone that the Nile River was a god. Mm-hmm. And no one knew. Even his own soldiers that would come with him to the Nile River, he would go to the corner and they would think that he's meditating or something. They didn't know that he's going to the bathroom. So obviously Hashem said, go then, at that moment, as he's going. I'll tell you exactly when he's going, you're going to go and embarrass him right away. Show him, hey, Hashem sees everything. You can't uh, pretend. So after that, there's the first plague, and the first plague is blood. There's a few things we can learn from blood. First of all, it's a uh, when uh, uh, when uh, Hashem told him to do the uh, to hit the water. It was Aaron that hit the water, not Moshe. Why not Moshe? Because Moshe was saved by the water. Exactly. Moshe was saved by the water when he was a baby. Okay. So he owed the water a karata tov. He was saved when he was a baby. Yeah. His mom put him in the water and the Nile eventually led to him to get uh, found by uh, by yeah. 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 So the water saved him. So he says, how could I make the water turn into blood when it showed me it saved my life technically? Which teaches us that if you owe a karata tov, your mm-hmm. gratefulness to something that's you know, part of the world, something that's in nature, of course you have to remember how much gratefulness you owe to people. Somebody helped you in your life, lent you money, somebody gave you a job, somebody helped you do tshuva, somebody gave you even uh, money for coffee, somebody gave you a ride to a day, to, 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 to whatever, to work, anything, anything that people did for you, you have to be grateful. If Moshe Rabbeinu is not even willing to hit the water, he's not even willing to hit the water, why? Because the water saved me 80 years ago. Well, it's not that water saved him on purpose. Not the water thought, oh, you know what? Should I save him? Should I not save him? Maybe, maybe, I don't know if I like him. What family does he come from? Is he Sephardic? Is he Ashkenazi? No, he didn't think about it. It's water. Water is doing its thing. So, Shalabenu doesn't want to hit the water. <laughs> Second thing is, why is he punishing the water? Why is him going towards the water first? Because as I said, the water was, uh, the Nile River was considered another uh, idol for the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. And Hashem hates idol worship. So when he punishes somebody, when he punishes a nation or he even punishes a person, the first thing he's going to punish is the parts he hates. First thing he hates is idol worship. Mm -hmm. So the first thing he's showing them, oh, you're thinking that your uh, Nile River is a god, it can't even protect itself. As I'm turning it into water, and your, your water into blood, and now it's going to smell terrible. It's going to make it smelly. You're a little smelly god, fake god. So it shows people that Hashem is in control of everything. But even more so, it's something for us to learn about. When Hashem is trying to wake somebody up, usually what's the thing that happens to them? It's a few things that happen to a person. First thing that happens usually for most people, money. They lose money. Money in the Torah is considered dami. Money is considered life. And it, but money is another form of idol worship. Because people spend their life chasing money. And if you see the dollar bill, it says, In God we trust. Why is it saying God we trust? Because most people think the dollar is the God. That's, what they, that's the way they behave. So sometimes when Hashem wants to wake somebody up or wants to punish somebody, one of the things that could happen is losing money. The third thing is about the blood is that that's actually one of the ways that Amisal became very, very rich. If you remember from uh, the uh, when we talked about it in the past, 
Every time Am Yisrael, Am Yisrael was not affected by these plagues. So when Am Yisrael would take water, it would be water. If the Egyptian grabbed the water from the, uh, to from the Jew, it would turn into blood. There was so much blood that even the walls would bleed. Because the walls had, you know, to make, to make the, uh, the bricks, you needed water. So the water in the bricks turned to blood. So even the walls and the houses and the castle, everything was blood everywhere. So the Egyptians noticed that the only water they, you know, they have to drink. Only way is to buy it from the Jews. <laughs> if they bought it from the Jews, it stayed water. If they stole it from the Jews or took it from them by force, it turned the water into uh, blood. Right. And that's actually one of the ways that Amisa became very, very rich. When it turned from slaves to becoming very, very wealthy. Because Hashem promised Avram that when they leave e Egypt, <laughs> they're going to leave with Rechush <laughs> Gadol. They're going to leave with a lot of treasure. Now, even though the bigger treasure that Hashem is planning on giving them is after they leave Egypt, he didn't want anyone to question the promise he made to, uh, to Avram. Mm -hmm. He said, okay, let them leave with some money already now. One of the ways they got money is from the plague of blood. Second thing is we go into, uh, why, why do we have blood? Why, what's the measure for measure punishment? One of the reasons why Hashem turned the, blood, the, the water into blood, one, as I told you, is idol worship, was the, uh, to punish their idol. The second reason is because the Egyptians did not allow the Jewish women, the, the, Vrim, the, the Hebrews, to uh, go and, uh, into the mikveh, to use the Nile as a mikveh. He said, you're not allowed my children to have, to use the mikveh, to have kosher children mm -hmm. to do the mitzvah. Okay, so now you can't use it either. <laughs> but as soon as the, uh, the water turned to blood, the chartumim, the necromancers, also did the same thing. They turned some water into blood, but they couldn't undo it. So... But Paro still said, okay, they could do the first part. They had less practice than Moses. I don't believe, I'm not freeing on this side. I don't believe, I believe that uh, it's not coming from God, from this God that Moshe is telling us. Moses is just a good magician. Next plague is the uh, frogs. It says the, uh, once, uh, once the uh, plague came, it says, um, okay. So it says But if you refuse to send out behold I shall strike your uh, strike your entire boundary with frogs the river will swarm with frogs and they shall ascend and come into your palace and your bedroom and your bed and into your house, and your servants, and your people, and into your ovens, and into your kneading bowls, and into you, and your people, and all your servants, will the frogs ascend. So one thing is about the frogs, the frogs was outright torture, there's actually in the uh, parasha, there's ten times it says Tzfaldeim, the reason why it says Tzfaldeim ten times, is because it says that the frogs were so bad, it was as bad as all of the plagues put together, because they couldn't go anywhere, without having frogs. Even when they would have sweat, they would sweat, their sweat, anything that was water would turn into frogs. The sweat will turn into frogs. Frog, it says, the frogs are going into you. The frogs were inside their bodies. And it uh, also uh, would eat part of their, uh, uh, their uh, private parts and actually make some people not able to have kids. Um, yeah, this is some serious punishment. Um... Wow. Also, the uh, the frogs would uh, literally be everywhere. There would be nothing that they can't have. The frogs wouldn't be. But something very interesting is that once the play comes, it says this is in uh, chapter eight, verse two. It says Aaron stretched his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frog infestation ascended. Not frogs. It says frog. Lama frog. It says that's fardea. Lot Tzfardeim. There's ten times it says Tzfardeim, but one time it says Tzfardeim. With the beginning, it says Tzfardeim. One Tzfardeim. Why? Uh, Rashi says that originally, or actually Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva says, uh, originally, uh, the uh, plague started with one giant frog. 
one giant frog, and every time the, uh, the Egyptians tried to kill it, this giant frog, and every time they would hit it, millions of frogs would come out of it. And they would hit it again, and more frogs would come out of it. So this, say, uh, the... Uh, and even though after a while, if you hit it one time, more frogs come out. You hit it two times, more frogs come out. You hit it another time, more frogs come out. After three, four times, you realize it's not working. Right? But they would still hit it. And it got to the point where the frogs filled the entire land, all the way to the border. Why? Because it got to a point where they were so angry, they just wanted to have revenge on the frog. Ever meet somebody that says, listen, I don't care if I spend every dollar that I have suing this guy, I'm going to make sure he goes broke. I don't care what I have to do. I don't even if I get arrested, I'm going to make sure he gets in trouble or something happens. People that want to take revenge. Mm-hmm. Revenge is not a good thing. Uh, it says only Hashem is allowed to take revenge. So the revenge is not for us to take. Uh, and uh, when someone is work is is a uh, lives their life with revenge in their mind, they can't think clearly. And that's exactly what what happened. It only causes more damage. So with the uh, one of the things that uh, the frogs uncovered that made the situation for the uh, for the Egyptians worse where they end up losing money is because the uh, Egyptians and the uh, the nation of Kush had a had a uh, war they were going to they were at war for where the border is where the border of Kush and Egypt was mm-hmm. and this plague it says that the uh, the Tzfaldeim, all the frogs went all the way until the border so they would stop exactly at the border of Kush which was okay. Which was where Kush thought was the border, not where the Egyptians thought were the border. So, mm-hmm. so in essence, the uh, Egyptians ended up losing some land because of it. So it hurt their pocket also. Um, next one is Kinim. Oh, I'm sorry. The uh, the uh, the the frogs. Why do we get it? We measure for measure. Each one of the punishments was measure for measure. One of the ways that they were, the uh, Egyptians would torture. The Jews is by waking them up in the middle of the night with a lot of noises to get them to work. At 3 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, a lot of noises. says, oh, you don't let my people sleep? You're not going to sleep either. So the frogs were quacking, quacking, can't stop uh, the whole night, not allowing anyone to sleep. Uh, imagine that the quack is not just outside, it's inside your body. So now you're, uh, you're, you're Am Israel. The frogs are chirping, they're doing their thing, they're jumping around. And you don't hear it? Amisai doesn't hear it? Doesn't get it. Amisai lives in Goshen. Of course. So the, uh, the, uh, so the frogs know. would not go inside Goshen. The Goshen would right. stay where they are. They would stay in the border. They wouldn't go inside Goshen. <laughs> frogs would just like, just like the frogs uh, knew to go to the border of Kush and not go inside Kush also and spread even outside of Egypt. The same one that brought him here is the one that controls. <laughs> and that's why at the end, once uh, once a uh, Paro asked a, uh, you know, pleaded with uh, Moshe to stop this plague, a, uh, the, uh, the frogs, um, he said that these frogs will only go, they're only going to be in the uh, back of the Nile. The rest of them are going to die. So the frogs, a lot of them actually went into the Nile, but a lot of them jumped into a fire, into the ovens, and died, like committed suicide. Why? Because that was the order of Hashem. Hashem said, you all need to go, you need to leave. Either die, go to the water. So a lot of frogs died on Kiddush Hashem, doing what Hashem wanted them to do. If the Egyptians went to Goshen, he wanted to step. He won. He so he started going to Goshen. Now he's in Goshen. Oh, he's already in Goshen. I think the frogs would be on top of him, inside him, everything. But it still wouldn't affect any Jews. So he wouldn't be able to even make it to Goshen. Same thing. Same thing with yeah. same thing yeah. with the uh, with the rest of the uh, with the plagues. The rest of the plagues did not affect the Jews. One actually midrash in uh, one midrash says that it wasn't frogs. It was actually a uh, crocodiles. There was also oh. not only frogs, but it was also crocodiles. And uh, there's an interesting midrash where it says here that um, these only there's only one saltwater crocodile today that's a man eater. 
And it's called a uh, Estuarine Crocodile. And in the parasha it says that the only place they will ever exist after this plague is over is in the Nile. And this crocodile, the only place it exists is in the Nile. No, no, no. I don't so. Did it eat the people, this crocodile? Yeah. What do you think it was there to ask them if they want to have coffee? Maybe. No, no, I'm saying this crocodile, was he part of this plague? Yes, yes. There's a midrash that says that it wasn't just frogs, it was also crocodiles. Because in the movie Exodus, the first plague they show is the crocodile. And I'm like, whoa, what did they get this time? I, 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 didn't, I didn't see it, but, huh? uh, I didn't see it, oh, but I yeah, heard that it has it's, nothing, it's not no, exactly following movie. it a lot. The movie uh, is not another, it's not exactly exact, exact, it's not it's, exact uh, 100% midrash. Not, uh, any, uh, they make it. Like yeah, it's not okay. interesting. So, uh, moving forward, we got not that much time left. Uh, only another two oh, and a half hours. Least. At least. So, anyway, uh, then you have the lice. Lice was one of the things, the, the plague that uh, caught the Khartoumim, the, uh, the necromancers, by surprise because this went over them. This is the one time that they said. Uh, the sorcerer said to Paro, it is a finger of God. This is the first time the, the necromancer said, these plagues are coming from God, they're not coming from Moses. Now they're starting to believe. Why do they start believing? Now the, the plague of the uh, lice was uh, another horrific one where it was literally everything turned to lice, even the, uh, the ground, the, the sand in the ground turned to lice. It was like a foot and a half of lice. So there was no way you could escape it. Everything would instantly, as soon as the uh, plague came, everyone had lice on them, except the Jews. Now, why why did the Chaltumim say that it's uh, Elohimi? Why is that the finger of God is in here? Because the Chaltumim said that um, in order to control demons, their power was by using demons, evil spirits. But demons. And they have no power over tiny things. Things like bugs and stuff like that. It's usually big things, whether it's an animal, a dog, uh, a human being, things that are bigger. So as soon as they saw that this is a, uh, this slice are obviously very small, said, no, this is not, uh, this is not, uh, a, uh, not he's, Moses is not a wizard or a sorcerer like us. This is coming from, from his God. Mm -hmm. One thing that's actually good to know about uh, about evil spirits is that uh, they still affect us today in the exile. There's no people say that there's a, Torah says there's no demons in Israel, but there are demons outside of Israel. Not as much as they used to be, uh, but there's still certain things to be careful of. Okay, I'll give you a few things that I uh, remember. First off, if uh, after the middle of the night, the Hebrew night, not uh, 12 o'clock, sometimes it's 11.40, sometimes it's 1.30 in the morning, the Hebrew chatzot, in the middle of the night, make sure that if you uh, walk away from a cup of water or any, wa or any drink that's not sealed, you can't drink it. <laughs> Don't drink <laughs> it. <laughs> It has evil, uh, it can have evil spirits. Food also, leftover food. Yeah, mostly, from what I know, is the, uh, is the water. Water or any drink. After chatzot. After chatzot. Yeah, no, regular, regular, during the day, it's fine. After chatzot, if you walk, in any way you should do this, not, not do it, but as far as demons in general, they're not as much in Israel as there is here. Or what if it's, in Israel. it's like this, it's okay, because you're not bothered. Sure, it's closed. It's closed. No, but if it's open, if so the bottle you have is open, it's not covered. So a demon If you can walk away from it, walk away from it, it's not good. A demon can Second go thing, into it? it can go into it, it can, it can affect you, you can have a big yetzal off or something, do something oh, foolish. That's one of the things. Another thing is, well, there's a lot to cover, so let's try to uh, go through these three other, other things. Uh, another thing is a... Um, Oh, um, onion, onion. If you have, if you okay. use onions or garlic, sure. okay. if you use onion and garlic, if you cut them, whatever you don't eat, Zrok. you have to throw it out. Can't yeah. don't onion. keep a uh, don't Zrok. keep half the onion or the cut garlic, 
and uh, eat it the next day. I have to throw it. After you use it one night, and after you use that day, you can't keep it for the next day. Now, if you have an onion, you don't have to throw it out. What you could do is put the peel on it. If you keep the peel on the onion, it's okay. It's okay. Now you're gonna ask me now, as far as anyone knows how to cook, you know, there's in the in the uh, supermarket today, a very common product is peeled garlic. So you tell me that's not that's not good. It has kosher on it even. How could it be? So the garlic. It's not that if it's just peeled. The garlic, if it doesn't have the head, the head of the garlic, where it's that little stem, the end piece, Mm -hmm. once, so as long as it has that end piece, it's not considered uh, completely peeled. Mm -hmm. So that way you could eat it. But if you, if it doesn't have, if you actually cut garlic in in pieces, and uh, after the uh, initial use, don't eat it after it's uh, kept overnight. Uh, it's uh, it actually it says it's a sakanat uh, nefashot. It's a life risk. Yeah. Uh, Can I put a ziplock? <laughs> another thing. Another thing is a uh, for bad you know not only bad spirits but also losing uh, you know forgetting is if you uh, put your uh, shirt backwards, put your shirt on backwards, you know inside out. Mm-hmm. That's not good. Or if you have several shirts, let's say you have your tzitzit and your, uh, sh- uh, you know, uh, a shirt, don't put them on together, one at a time. Uh, a lot of this stuff is, is in the Gemara and some of it is initial, in the... Initial or... Anytime, don't take it off together, don't uh, put it on together. Don't take it off together, don't put it on together. It causes you to forget, especially if you're learning Torah. If you learn Torah, you take off uh, uh, two shirts at once, or put them on two at once, or you put a shirt upside out, it causes you to uh, lo- uh, forget your Torah. Another thing is also olives. If you eat a lot of olives, it causes you to forget your Torah. If you want to have better memory, then you have to then, uh, eat uh, olive oil, drink olive oil. So if you like olives, the best thing to do is put the olives in olive oil. So the one is making you like forget, the other one's making you remember, it's a nice balance. It's not, nothing, it's nothing. Uh, not that I know, at least. Okay, moving on back to the Pasha. Yeah, it's, it's all, I didn't make it up. This is just a... Uh, the water, the onion, the garlic, that's all in the Gemara. No, the... The onion is true. Onion is true. What, the rest of what I say is not true? No, that's a scientific truth. Oh. The rest I don't know. It's getting bacteria very fast. The onion. Okay. From there, if you sip or something, cut onion, put it here, it will wipe out the sickness and you will be fine. Okay, okay. Actually, if you are... Uh, if you want to, uh, yeah, yeah, you put it in socks and so on. Yeah, there's a few, a few ways to use an onion. Okay, moving forward. Uh, okay, uh, next, uh, next plague is wild beasts. Wild beasts. Um, oh, as far as the, uh, I keep forgetting the, uh, the main thing. Uh, measure for measure, reason why lice came is because the, uh, the Egyptians did not allow the Jews to um, take showers. Mm-hmm. So they had bad hygiene. So the punishment was for them, for the Egyptians to have bad hygiene by having, excuse me, these lice all over their body. Wow. Next thing is wild beasts. The wild beast is actually a very interesting uh, uh, punishment because Hashem literally brought all of the most dangerous animals in the world including the polar bear, the Bengal tiger, the wolves, animals that in natural way cannot exist in Egypt. Polar bear needs snow, and so on. <laughs> and he brought all of these animals with their habitat, with their surroundings with them. So the polar bear came with the ice. The tiger came with the jungle. Wow. The uh, snakes, <laughs> the uh, you know these uh, the wolves. Everyone came with like a house, like what they needed to survive. And uh, they went only against 
the Egyptians. This is actually this particular plague showed, and also the um, uh, the next couple of them showed Paro that not only is Hashem in control of the world, but He's in specific control of what's going on in every single moment. He's not that He's created the world because He's showing them that unlike everything else, He can see that there's a Jew walking around. Tiger is his pet. Next thing you know, an Egyptian walks around and he's, uh, he attacks him. So they're only attacking the Egyptians. They're not attacking the uh, the Jews. So after this, when uh, when Paro asks Moshe to stop this whole thing with the uh, with the uh, with the wild beasts, Moshe says, "Oh, Moshe says, you know, let us let us go." And um, and Paro says, "You know, listen, go bring offering to your God, do a korban for your God, but in the land." Here, I mean, I mean, do it in Egypt. And Moshe says, no, it's not proper for us to do it here. Uh, for uh, So what was the argument behind uh, behind uh, Paro? Paro was telling him, listen, you're saying your God is everywhere. Your God is in the heaven, earth, he's in Israel, he's here, he's in Jamaica, he's everywhere. So what do you need to go into the desert... To do a korban for him. Do it here. Do it here. This is what we call Naval Birshut Torah. This is someone that is using, in essence, Torah knowledge, Torah facts, to make a sin, to make an excuse for them for their way to live. Mm-hmm. So it's like a uh, Someone that's not really looking to do tshuva, someone that's not really looking for a uh, the truth, it's someone that's looking for excuses. It's someone that, uh, you know, will study Gemara, or will study a, uh, you know, Shulchan Aruch, Halakha, to find a way of how to make, how to get around the system. That's what Naval Gershut Torah is. So after the uh, the plague was over, unlike the uh, lice and the frogs that died, the uh, all these beasts ran away and like left Egypt. They didn't uh, they didn't die. Why? Because Hashem wanted to make sure that um, the Egyptians don't benefit out of these animals in any way. Because if the animals died, they, would, they could use their leather, they could use their skin to sell it. So Hashem didn't want them to benefit in any way. Uh, and he uh, cut the whole time short. Uh, he, he let them go. There's only seven plagues in this parasha. We're up to number five. Um, what was the planet meet and meet on that one? The measure for measure. Oh, the measure for measure. The uh, Egyptians had a uh, also a zoo of animals, and one of the things they would do for fun is throw Jews into the zoo with the lions to see what would happen and watch the Jews get uh, get killed. So Hashem says, okay, you like to throw my, my children into the zoo, into the cage with the lion? Okay, I'm going to send the lion to your house. Let's right, see what you can see, what you have to say about that. Uh, the uh, next thing, the fifth plague is an epidemic. This is pretty much bringing disease on all of the uh, animals. Killed all Pretty much all, almost all of the animals that the Egyptians had made them lose a whole lot of money. But very, you know, uh, a uh, Moshe didn't even go to Paul in this one to tell him if you want to let the people go. Immediately the next one it says Hashem said to Moshe, "Now on, take for yourselves handfuls of furnace suit uh, and let Moses hurl it heavenward before Pharaoh's eyes. It will become dust over the land of Egypt and it will become boils erupting into blisters." So the next one already is boil, shechim. Uh, mm-hmm. Everyone had abscesses 
all over their body. Now, if you know what an abscess is, an abscess is a internal infection. If you have one, it's extremely painful. If you have two, it's pretty much debilitating. Even if you have one sometimes, it depends where it is. So they had it all over their body. So it was much a, uh, a disaster. That's like a, a boil. Yes. Yeah. From an internal infection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this again also was because of the hygiene. They didn't allow the, uh, the measure for measure. They didn't allow the Jews to uh, be uh, clean and so on. So Hashem punished them. Okay, so that's six. We're already going to get to number seven. This is the most part. It's the most interesting part. Um, so now Moshe comes to Paro and he tells him, listen, Hashem is going to bring, I shall send all of my plagues. That's what Hashem said. Which is that the next plague, what he's saying to him is that the next plague is worse than any, all of them. The next plague is hail. The hail that Hashem is going to bring to, to Egypt is ice and fire at the same time. So it's a ball of ice with lava inside it, which is against nature. In order for this plague to happen, the angel of fire and the angel of water had to make peace, just to do Ritzon Hashem, just to do Hashem's will. So, Moshe comes to uh, and tells this to, uh, to Paro. And it says something very, very interesting. So it says here is that those people that they um, feared the word of Hashem when in, even the, the Egyptians they feared the word of Hashem they feared this plague is coming they went inside and they took their animals inside but those who did not take Hashem's word to their heart stayed outside and died so this is this is actually teaches us something very interesting. It says, dvar Hashem, the ones that feared Hashem, went inside. So it says, so so now it's supposed to say the ones that if I tell you what's fear of Hashem in Hebrew is Yira, Yira Shamaim. What's the opposite of Yira Shamaim? No. No fear, right? So here he's telling you there's no such thing as no fear. There's no Yirat Shemaim or Chosu Yirat Shemaim. Meaning there's no fear of Hashem and no fear of Hashem. What it's saying here, it's either you fear Hashem or it says, Vashel lo sam libo. Meaning someone that didn't you, pay attention. You don't lo sam lev. There's no, there's no someone, there's no such thing as someone that's not afraid of Hashem. He's not afraid because he doesn't know Hashem. He doesn't really, he's not paying attention to the details. If you, don't, if, you don't, if you don't pay attention to the details, of course you're not going to fear Hashem because you don't believe in Him. But as soon as you know that Hashem exists, of course you're going to be scared. So that's, that's, a, that's one of the things in the, in the Pasuk where we learn about what uh, the language of Hebrew, what is the opposite of Yerat Shemaim. Now, this uh, particular plague, as I said, was, uh, water, was uh, hail and, uh, and with fire inside it. Now, after uh, Paro begged Moshe to stop it, Hashem stopped the plague, but he stopped the hail in midair. There's still hail coming down, but as soon as Moshe prayed, the froze. ice froze in the middle of the air, and Hashem took it back. Some of it came back. It's, he kept it in, in, in uh, what's called, in outer space. 
Some of it came at the time of Joshua, during one of the wars. To mm -hmm. one of the wars, Joshua prayed for Hashem to help him. So Hashem took some of this hail with fire in it and went against the enemies of, uh, of uh, Am Yisrael. And the rest of it yeah. is waiting until the war of Gog Magog. Mm -hmm. Till the end of the world, till the end of the last war, the war of Gog and Magog, to come it's going to be <laughs> one of the weapons that Hashem is going to use against the, uh, the wicked. Uh, so it's still, way, it's still somewhere in, uh, in uh, outer space. It's on the way. <laughs> it's on the way. Um, let me see. Yeah. The, uh, as far as the, uh, the, proof, the, the source of where that it's waiting in the middle of the air, it's in, uh, Sefer, uh, it's in Ezekiel 38.22. Chapter 38.22. Uh, that's where the uh, source uh, is. Um, let's see this. Okay, so now at the end, I'm going to finalize with two interesting things. At the end, Paro is begging Moshe... Go pray to your God right now and stop this plague. And Moshe says, no, after, when I leave the city, once I leave the city, then I'll pray and then the plague will stop. But the city is not outside the, uh, the door. It's going to take him a while to leave the city. Why, why is he saying when I leave the city? He says, In the city, your, your, your city is full of idol worship. It's full of Tum'ah. I can't pray here. Can't pray in a, in a filthy place like here with all this idol worship. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things we need to understand. Is as far as when you pray, you have to be very, very careful where you pray. Sometimes you go to a uh, hotel and they have you know statues in the rooms, or you go into different places. Like uh, for example, somebody wants to uh, doesn't know anything. They they're passionate about doing tshuva. They're starting to learn. They don't. They never heard. They not to learn learn Torah inside a bathroom. Or next to anything that smells really bad. If it smells okay. very bad, you're not yeah. allowed to uh, learn yeah. Torah. Yeah. So, filth and smell affects the neshama. So you have to make sure that whenever you pray, you have you pray in an appropriate place. Whether it's in your house or in a beknesset, doesn't matter. The point is, is that it's obviously if you beknesset, you have minyan. Yeah. But the point is that, that you have to make sure that you're praying in a... A uh, place that doesn't have uh, too much in it and, and, and it filled. Smells good. Yeah, it smells good. It smells good, yeah. To the animals, too. Uh, okay. Yes, okay. as far as animals, you have to try to, uh, if you have an animal in the house, yeah. put them somewhere yeah. else. Uh, the dog does not need to do the feeling with you. Yeah. No? They, they, no, not they don't need to do the feeling. They don't have to do the feeling. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. But another thing in regards to spirits and tum'ah, there is one thing that's not allowed in Judaism. I heard the story actually this week. Uh, it's mamash crazy, um, and it kind of—I don't know—it shook me up. I don't know. I just—I uh, say these things a lot during the shiurim, but it's something that really, you, when you hear something you already know, um, it's, it's it's different. So, in uh, in uh, Judaism, you're not allowed to do seance. No Ouija board stuff like that. You're not going to seance, but of course people don't really listen, especially when they're not religious. Uh, actually, King Shaul, which was very very righteous, did a seance, uh, which was a sin, but nonetheless he did it. He did it once, uh, and that was actually the day he found that he was going to die in the war the next day. He and his sons. Him and his sons, but uh, anyway, this uh, rabbi tells a story that just happened recently. Like, literally, within the last couple of weeks, or something like that, a, a group of kids did a seance. So this rabbi sees one of his, uh, one of the kids, he's, he knows, but he sees him, he became religious, young kid, became religious. Like, you know, Peya is all of a sudden is wearing a tzitzit, he hasn't seen him in a while, he goes, well, what happened? Wow, oh, what happened? And, uh, this is in Israel. He goes, you're never gonna, you're never, you're never, like, you're never gonna know, the Rav. We did a seance. Yeah. <laughs> do seance. He goes, yeah, yeah, I know we're not allowed to do it. I did a seance, though. I did a seance. Okay, no. I did a seance, and we brought back the neshama of Dudu Topaz. <laughs> Who's that? 
Dude Tupaz is a very, very famous comedian actor in, uh, in Israel that died. He committed suicide. Ah, TV host. TV host. TV host. He died recently. Yeah, yeah. Recently. recently. Stand That's, up uh, his thing and everything. He killed himself. Uh, had a big balagan. Anyway, he says we brought back Dude Tupaz. Yeah. And we asked him, well, where are you? And he says, I am in a very bad place and I'm suffering terribly. And I said to him, uh, do you want us to do something for you? Maybe uh, we do Kaddish for you? Or a uh, pray for you? He goes, no. I don't want you to do anything for me. When is the last time you ask, you ever tell somebody else, I want to pray for you? They say, no, don't pray for me? I don't remember, especially if it's... So they ask him, why not? Because because your prayer is not going to help me. You're all reshaim. You don't keep Shabbat. <laughs> <laughs> That's That's not a joke. You know, the kid said, the minute I heard you that, I took everything on. Oh, oh, yeah. He says, you don't keep Shabbat, you're all reshaim. Your prayer doesn't get answered in Shemaim. If anything, it makes me worse for me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it. Dude, the past said it. What are you with us? He's over there. Wow. <laughs> it's, a, it's crazy, right? It's true. I say it. I try to say it every week about Shabbat, Shabbat, Shabbat. People think I'm fanatic about Shabbat. I think it's the biggest problem we have in our generation. Mama should say uh, people don't realize what Shabbat is. People Shabbat. think if they go to the Knesset, it's okay for them Shabbat. to drive on Shabbat. Okay. But when you hear a story like this, you can't make stuff like this up. It shakes you up. Even some, even I'm keep Shabbat Baruch Hashem, but it still it shakes you up. It's like wow, it's, it's something, it's something of us. It's something crazy. But that's actually one of the things that the Gemara says. The Gemara says somebody, it's a, it's a Bechalel Shabbat. Their prayers are worth waste of time. It's to Avat Hashem. Someone says, no, no, I pray. Read Teilim, read Teilim. You don't keep Shabbat. It's worth nothing. So that's the thing. The prayers are not going to help you. Keep, there's no such thing. Chazal says, no such thing as tshuva without Shabbat. No such thing. We're about to finish. So, uh, six hours to Gainesville, six hours back. So, to, to finalize is that, is we have to ask ourselves a question. Paro got the first plague, blood, it's all there, you know, the frogs, the lice, you know, the, uh, all, all of the these animals. things, one after another. One test after another. But he never relented. You know, for the first several plagues, it was his own choice. But eventually, Hashem took the choice away from him mm -hmm. and hardened his heart. To say, okay, you know what? You didn't decide on your own during the first few few uh, plagues Keep to, to, leave, to let uh, Amisel go. Now I'm not going to let you make the choice. Now I'm not going to let you do tshuva. Mm -hmm. Just like what it says about somebody that's machti tarabim, someone that leads other people to sin. Like what these people are doing today, what we talked about in the beginning of the shiur, people are leading other people to make sin. Say lashon hara about a rabbi. Say lashon hara about anybody. Or right now they're trying to get other people not to come to lectures and things like that. Rabim. No tshuva. They close the gates of tshuva. It's Perkei Avot. Chapter 5, tw uh, 21. Somebody is Machtita Rabim. It's a, a special place in Gainom for them. <laughs> no, I'm serious. It's not. It's, 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 you cannot be worse no. than that. No. So, Paro <laughs> is making sins. Eventually, says, Hashem says to them, there's no tshuva for you. One test, two tests, three tests, four tests, five tests. Eventually, okay, you didn't pass five, five tests? That's it, no tshuva. From now on, I'm making a choice for you. Even when you want to do it, I'm going to give you a way that you're not going to do it. So here's the question. Last week, we finished with a good question. This week, we're also going to finish with another question. It's something that should make you think. Paro got one test, another, 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 and he never woke up. How many tests are we getting? 
from Hashem, and we're still not waking up. How many times does Hashem have to test us before we wake up and we say, you know what, maybe it's time for me to put a keep on my head, tzitzit on my uh, <laughs> body, yeah. and go straight. When is it going to come? How many more tests do you want? You lost money? Yes. My health is not so good? Yes. My marriage sucks? Yes. My, uh, you know, my, uh, you know, mental state of mind is terrible. I'm depressed? Yes. How many more things do you want to go bad? How many more tests do you want? What else do you want? You want six plagues, seven plagues, eight plagues? What do you want? Hashem to come to you like he came to Moshe Rabbeinu in the, uh, in the bush? How many more tests do you want? You want to go? <laughs> He's not coming. He's not coming. Not that I decide for him, but it says no, no prophet will be like Moshe. So no one will see it. Well, like it won't. Well, so that's the thing. Well, uh, how diff- We're now making fun of Paro, right? Paro is the wicked Paro. Hmm. But in reality, yeah, there's a little bit of Paro in us. Because we don't wake up right away. Moshe got rebuked at the beginning of the parasha. He never asked another question. Never questioned God after that. Paro, still after all the tests, he's still still not doing tshuva. Still not doing tshuva. We want to be Moshe, we want to be Paro. How many times you need Hashem to slap you in the face before you wake up and say, you know what, Hashem? Maybe For example, Boch Hashem, Daniel, look at him. Oh Hashem, anybody does tshuva. Oh Hashem, anybody does tshuva. But, uh, Daniel is one of the biggest successes, Oh Hashem. I used to all day. But the key is, what about the rest of us? Right. <laughs> Daniel's already tzaddik. What about the rest of us? Learn from me, man. So, that's one of the things you have to ask yourself every night. Today, am I going to be Moshe? Or am I going to be Paul? Oh, Adonai, Olam, Amen, Amen, Amen.